Welcome to According to Sam, folks. This is episode 179, and thank you guys for watching. Thank you for listening. Um, you know, I told you that we were going to get into talking about Mesopotamia and uh, the Mesopotamian cities, empires, gods, and um, uh, we're going to get into some Mesopotamia uh, stuff uh, at the end of this podcast, but something happened today that I want to talk about, and it gives me the opportunity to um, to reinforce what I've been telling you about the society of the witches, <laughs> uh, about these witches that are running our world, um, running our our country, and um, and and they're doing it through these secret orders, these secret societies. Uh, one of them being Freemasonry, but Freemasonry is not the only one. And uh, we were talking about the obelisk in the podcast uh, two podcasts ago, and then in the last podcast we talked about the Great Seal and uh, and more of their mythology and where. It comes from and how um, they are crypto witches that uh, many of them will present themselves as Christians, but they are not Christians at all. They are witches. Well, um, I want to start today by talking about a political party here in the United States in the early uh, infancy of this uh, country. In the 1830s, um, uh, there was a political party that was centered around um, being against the Masonic order, uh, uh, being against Freemasonry and rooting Freemasonry out of our country. These people um, that started this political party uh, believed that Freemasonry and the the witches in Freemason were a danger to this country. They posed a danger to this country, and um, they created a political party that was centered on that, and the party was called the Anti-Masonic Party. Um, they had national conventions. They had local conventions. This was the very first third party that uh, that came about in the United States. <clears throat> it was really the second party. Um, well, no, it was the third party because um, the first party was the, I think it was the Republican Democrat Party, and then Jackson created the Democrat uh, Party. I think that maybe he created the Democrat Party. Well, no, I think the Anti-Masonic Party uh, came about before Jackson created the Democratic Party. Um, anyway, I have a clip that talks about the the Anti-Masonic Party. I'm going to start off by playing this, and then uh, we'll get started and get into what I really want to talk about and what this brings us to. Uh, take a listen to this clip. Did you know that George Washington and Benjamin Franklin were members of a secret society? The Freemasons, one of the world's oldest fraternities, was an organization made up of wealthy, educated, powerful men whose members conducted elaborate initiation ceremonies, communicated using secret handshakes and symbols, and grew to have strong influence within the two dominant political parties in the United States. That's why there's witches, and that's something you need to understand is that uh, these witches, um, uh, they control both parties, the Republican and the Democratic Party. Um, I mean, uh, they can, again, be black, they can be white. Um, uh, these witches have put themselves everywhere, everywhere. And you have no idea who they are. I just wanted to uh, stop and say that, that they're not only Democrat witches, they're Republican witches as well. These was an organization made up of wealthy, educated, powerful men whose members conducted elaborate initiation ceremonies, communicated using secret handshakes and symbols, and grew to have strong influence within the two dominant political parties in the United States. That's why in 1828, newspaper publishers Thurlow Weed and Solomon Southwick founded the Anti-Masonic Party. 
It was the first time there was a third formally recognized political party in U.S. history. The anti-Masonic party wanted to expose and challenge the Masonic corruption and cronyism they felt was at the heart of U.S. government, which for too long had allowed the elite to enact new laws protecting their own interests at the expense of non-members. Though the Freemasons prided themselves on their secrecy, in reality, they weren't very good at it. By the end of the 1820s, newspapers were running stories on them, and the average American wanted change. As a result, the anti-Masonic party rode a wave of public support. By 1832, it held 25 congressional seats in the U.S. House of Representatives, and even ran a presidential candidate, William Wirt, who won almost 8% of the popular vote. Ultimately, they lost to Democrat Andrew Jackson, a confirmed Mason. And by the 1840s, this party of anti-Masons ceased to exist. So um, Andrew Jackson basically founded the Democratic Party, um, was a Freemason as many of the presidents of the United States have been uh, Freemasons. But after Jackson uh, won, then the party fizzled out. Uh, some of the members went and became uh, the Whig Party, joined with the Whig Party, uh, which is the precursor to the Republican Party. So it's safe to, uh, to say that the anti-Masonic Party uh, is at least one of the uh, precursors to the Republican Party. Uh, a lot of those guys, again, from the anti-Masonic Party went and joined the Whig Party, like this person here, Thaddeus Stevens. Thaddeus Stevens is probably one of the most important members of Congress. Um, he was a avid Reconstructionist, um, vehemently against slavery. This uh, guy is probably one of the main reasons he and Charles Sumner, who were in the Senate at this time, were probably two of the main reasons that um, the Civil War happened. They were against slavery and they uh, were against compromising on, on slavery, that they wanted it to end and they wanted to force the South to end slavery. A lot of people uh, correctly say that um, Abraham Lincoln didn't care about freeing the slaves. He just wanted peace in the Congress and for us to move beyond this. And that's what Lincoln has said himself, a house, he, he quoted Jesus, a house divided against itself cannot stand, that this nation cannot stand as long as we're divided. Well, the reason that we were so divided were, were because of people like Thaddeus Stevens, and Thaddeus Stevens uh, was a founder of the Republican Party, but if you come down here, you will also see that he was an active leader in the anti-Masonic Party as a fervent believer that Freemasonry in the United States was an evil conspiracy to secretly control the Republican system of government, is what Thaddeus Stevens said. And then says down here that he's one of the ones who joined the Whig Party. Uh, there, after um, the anti-Masonic Party broke up, uh, there he joined the Whig Party and was elected to Congress as a member of the Whig Party in 1848. Um, the other party where a lot of members uh, went from the anti-Masonic party was the Know Nothing Party. I think um, after a brief flirtation with the Know Nothing Party, I think that, um, and this is the guy, Charles Sumner from Massachusetts, the other guy that I was just telling you about. Um, not, um, so yeah, I think that said some of the other members went to the Know Nothing Party and then the Whig Party when the anti-Masonic party split up. Anyway, um, I introduce you to Thaddeus Stevens and tell you about uh, the Anti-Masonic Party because, as I said, they had uh, conventions. They had national conventions. They had state conventions. And I want you to read a little bit uh, of what Thaddeus Stevens says about the Freemason witches in one of these conventions. I don't know if you're going to be able to see that, but I'll read it to you, and uh, this will go in the show notes if you're interested in uh, in reading it. 
Hold on. Let me get this here. All right. Um, not sure if you're going to be able to see this, but just trust me. This is what it says. <laughs> a few months later, Stevens appeared as a delegate in the second state anti-Masonic convention in which he met, uh, in which, uh, which met at Harrisburg, uh, February 26, 1830. His appearance in, in the convention was characterized by the historian, Charles McCarthy, um, as an quote, as an event of the great significance to the cause of Pennsylvania, as an event that was of great significance to the cause of Pennsylvania. This is the state convention, anti-Masonic convention in Pennsylvania. Um, next paragraph. A few months later, Stevens was at it was a delegate to the first national convention of anti-Masons, which met at, at Philadelphia, September 11th, 1830. There he attracted attention by delivering several speeches strongly attacking Masonry. In one of these speeches on the Masonic influence upon the press, think about this, think about this. This is 1830. Almost 200 years ago, that this guy is complaining about the influence of Freemasons in the press and controlling the press. Um, his, the speech was titled "On the Masonic Influence Upon the Press." He deplored the uh, paucity of of publicity given to the convention and attribute the lack of Masonic. Uh, and attributed to, uh, oh, and he deplored the paucity of publicity given to the convention and attribute the lack to the Masonic influence. So basically, he's complaining that the press, the papers are not reporting on their conventions and the movement uh, of their party because they're controlled by Freemasonry. That, that's what he's saying about the press. 1830, 200 years ago, almost 200 years ago. He also made a speech defending the authenticity of various exposés of masonry. In the course of this speech, he made charges that the masons were exercising undue political influence throughout the country, um, as this was a favorite theme of Stevens. Um, some of his words will bear quoting. So this is a quote from um, from Thaddeus Stevens in the convention in Philadelphia in 1830. He says, look around, though but 100,000 of the people of the United States are Freemasons. Yet, all of the offices are of high profit and high honor are filled with gentlemen of that institution. Out of the number of law judges, out of the number of law judges in the state of Pennsylvania, um, 18, 20, 20, 20th, 18 out of 20 um, are Masons, and 22 out of 24 states of the union at this time, there are only 24 states of the union, 22 out of 24 states of the union now are now governed by Masonic chief magistrates. So he's basically um, 22 out of the 24 governors of the states of the United States are now governed uh, by, by Freemasons. Although not a 20th part of the voters of this Commonwealth, uh, and of the United States are Masons, yet they have contrived by concert to put themselves into 18 out of 20 of the offices of profit and power. They have contrived by concert to put themselves at the head of 18 of 20 of the offices of high of profit and power. And this was 200 years ago. So what have these witches done in the past 200 years in putting themselves into positions of profit and power? They're the heads of business. They're the heads of state. And they're witches. 
and they have allegiance to their witchcraft and to their covens. This is, uh, um, what's his name? Um, what's this guy's name? He's the guy um, who played the character, Tommy Lee Jones, played the character in Lincoln. Um, he played Thaddeus Stevens. So uh, Thaddeus Stevens, those are his words that the free, in 200 years ago, those are his words that the Freemasons have contrived by concert to put themselves into judges' positions, into heads of business, um, uh, the mob, even in crime, the, the, the criminals are Freemasons and witches. Um, in academia, again, in, in every single position of power and profit, Thaddeus Stevens said 200 years ago that these witches have put themselves in charge of and in positions of power. And they've taken secret oaths in the dark. Um, I played the clip of the woman uh, that left the Order of the Eastern Star in my last podcast. And she was commenting on how when she was initiated into the witchcraft, the very first thing that they did was blindfold her. And I was explaining to you in the last podcast about how Everything to these people is about light and their whole mythology is about Lucifer, the light bringer, bringing the light of knowledge uh, to them. So um, in this ceremony that they do when they bring you in as a new initiate, that's why they blindfold you, because at the end of this little ritual, they take the the blindfold off and they say, now you're in the light. (laughs) Now you have come from the darkness into the light after your initiation. And now you are part of this coven and you are a witch. This is our Supreme Court, our current Supreme Court. Uh, the three, these three women, uh, Sotomayor, uh, Jackson, Kagan, they're all put on the bench by Democrats. And I love the way they take this picture because the, the justices that are put on the bench by Democrats, they're on the end. And then these six in the middle here, these six are all put on the bench by Republicans. These three that are standing in the back, these three were all put on the bench by Donald Trump. This guy here was put on the bench, John Roberts, by George W. Bush. This guy, Alito, I believe that uh, George Bush's father put him on the bench and uh, Ronald Reagan put Clarence Thomas on the bench. Um, One of the things that I think is so interesting about these six right here that were all put on the bench by Republicans is that they're all Roman Catholic. Every single one of these six justices are Roman Catholic. And I started thinking about this and the fact that um, that the lifeblood of the Republican Party is evangelical Christians. <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's the lifeblood of the Republican Party. And there's not one single evangelical Christian on the Supreme Court. I'm sorry, I said that. I wanted to check that. Um, I was wrong about uh, George Bush actually nominated Clarence Thomas. It wasn't Reagan. And I think so. I think that George Bush... Uh, Senior also nominated Alito, too. I want to make sure about that. George W. Bush. Okay. All right. So Donald Trump nominated these three. Um, George H.W. Bush nominated uh, 
um, Clarence Thomas and then George W. Bush. I didn't know that he had two uh, nominate nominees. So George Bush is what it says nominated. George W. Bush nominated uh, Alito and uh, Roberts. Anyway, um, these guys, especially this one, John Roberts, I want to focus on him. And let's go back to what uh, Thaddeus Stevens says. He says that um, uh, he's speaking about the judges in Pennsylvania when he says this, out of the number of law judges in the state of Pennsylvania, 18 of 20 are now Masons, and 22 out of 24 states of the Union are now governed by Masons. And then he says at the bottom here, they have contrived by concert to put themselves into positions of high profit and power, of profit and power. And you think about these guys that George Bush and Trump put on the bench. Now, Trump, he put out a list of the judges that he was going to lay. If you remember that uh, that there was an open in the middle of the uh, 2016 campaign, um, Judge uh, uh, Scalia, um, he dies mysteriously, um, and there is an open an open Supreme Court seat. So Donald Trump put out a list so he could you know keep people. Uh, Republican voters, you know, uh, you know, keep them calm about uh, him not being in politics, not knowing anything about him, the type of justices that he would pick. And he put out a list before he was even sworn in, before the election even happened. He put out this list of justices that he would uh, choose from. And they were all justices from the Federalist Society. So all these Federalist Society justices... Um, I, I I would love to see um, how many of them are Roman Catholic because um, every single one of the justices that he picked off that list were Roman Catholic and like not just uh, fair weather Roman Catholic like were um, raised Roman Catholic went to Roman Catholic Jesuit schools their entire. Um, their entire schooling from grade school to, to high school, um, uh, to college, going to Catholic schools. Um, so these are hardcore Catholics, not fair weather Catholics. Um, and, and Roberts, uh, Roberts is a hardcore, uh, Catholic and, 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 you know, so is Alito, and so is is Thomas. They all claim to be, but I mean, these four right here, I, I think they're kind of on a different level. What happened today? Why am I talking about the Supreme Court and talking about all this? Because we have a huge problem with our border right now, and the state of Texas is doing everything that they can to to protect not only the state of Texas, but to protect the rest of the country. Because when they come in from the state of Texas, then uh, uh, they're being shipped around. uh, Some by the governor from Texas is uh, sending them to other cities, but the Biden administration is sending them to other uh, cities. And we've had a record amount of crossings since Biden was first elected, a record amount of crossings, and the state of Texas is doing everything that they can to prevent these illegal crossings, and every time they they implement a policy, I'm talking every single time since Biden has come into office, every single time that Governor Abbott and the state of Texas has implemented a new policy to try to block this illegal immigration the Biden administration sues the state of Texas and the Supreme Court sides with the Biden administration. Now, why if why is the Supreme Court siding with the Biden administration if you have six justices that are appointed by Republicans and only three justices appointed by Democrats? How are the how are the Democrats continuing to win these immigration cases 
when more justices, <laughs> there's two times as many justices appointed by Republicans on the bench than Democrats, than uh, or were appointed by Democrats. How is it that Democrats continue to win these cases in the Supreme Court? But this is the latest case that they won today. Take a listen. The Supreme Court ruling in favor of removing sharp razor wire installed by Texas and rivers along the border between U.S. and Mexico. The five to four vote now clears the way for federal agents to actually cut down the wire, which administration officials have called dangerous and inhumane. Our senior Washington correspondent, Devin Dwyer, joins me now. So, Devin, the ruling uh, pretty much delivers a huge win for the Biden administration. At least temporarily, Kira. This is a big deal for the Biden administration and that showdown uh, between Texas Governor Greg Abbott and the federal government uh, as the nation is experiencing this crisis uh, of unlawful immigration at the border. So it's a crisis, and everybody knows that it's a crisis. And the and and the Supreme Court, this Supreme Court. Let me show you guys again. This Supreme Court right here delivers. Biden, another huge win. Another, I mean, this is not just once. This is every single time the Biden administration sues the state of Texas over a policy, the Supreme Court is siding with them, with the Biden administration over and over again. It is as if they want the immigration, this illegal immigration to happen. It, it, it's, it's as if they want the flood of migrants coming over the border. I mean, that's the only thing that would make sense is that they want this to happen. You're telling me that they can't secure the border? I want you to see this. This is the border between Egypt and Gaza. Look at this thing. People say that, that borders don't work. Look at that thing. Look at all that razor wire. I mean, Egypt must really want to keep the Gazans out of Egypt because look at this. Are you telling me? But but the Supreme Court just ruled in a 5-4 decision that this razor wire that, that the Egyptians have put up to keep Gazans out of Egypt, that that razor wire is inhumane. That's what the Supreme Court just ruled in a 5-4 decision. Mind you, the United States government uses razor wire to protect government property, to protect themselves all the time. There's razor wire everywhere in this country protecting government buildings, government property. I mean, you go uh, to military uh, their uh, military uh, bases, they have the bases protected with razor wire. Businesses, uh, that looks like the, the fence over in Egypt. I don't, that's not one of ours. But anyway, um, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. The only thing that makes sense is that that they want the illegal immigration to take place. And, and that's why they're putting up such a, uh, such a big fight against the state of Texas when the state of Texas is implementing policies to stop uh, the illegal immigration. First question I have is that why is the Biden administration working against the state of Texas to stop this illegal flow of migration? I mean, you would think that the Biden administration would be working with the state of Texas. They should be working together in concert to stop this illegal migration. But that's not what's happening. What's happening is the state of Texas and other states are on their own trying to trying to um, to handle this problem and to take care of this crisis at the door 
the state of Texas is the door, but you have other states like Illinois, um, New York, um, where these migrants are pop, uh, popping up and they are having a huge effect on the infrastructure and what these cities are, are able to do for the people that are already struggling, the Americans that um, have been struggling, that are on the streets and um, eating at these food banks. Now you have uh, migrants coming in, an insane story that happened in New York. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago, they're experiencing bad weather. So they had kids go back to learning, um, uh, you know, at home, the way they were learning at, at COVID during Zoom calls and stuff like that, uh, rather than, than being at school and learning in front of a teacher because they had to open up to school so migrants could stay there uh, because of the, the bad weather. I mean, so what I'm telling you, it's not just a problem in Texas. Texas is the door, but it's having an effect all over this country. And instead of the Biden administration working with the state of Texas to shut the door, the Biden administration has been fighting the state of Texas on every single policy that they implement. And and the state of Texas sues, or the Biden administration sues, and the Supreme Court with six justices that were appointed by Republicans. The Supreme Court is siding with the Biden administration over and over and over again. Now, in this case that happened today, it was a 5-4 decision, and it was John Roberts. That's no surprise. John Roberts, I mean, has been ruling with Democrats ever since— going back to um the early 2000s and and when the bomb when the Obama administration when Republicans were suing the Obama administration over and over again he was siding with the Obama administration on on cases that have a huge um impact on um the the fabric and and the future of this nation not just small cases um but he was joined by this woman, Amy Coney Barrett, um, and the two of them uh, joined the three Democrats, <laughs> justices, the three liberal justices, and uh, they voted it down today. But again, um, or ruled against um, the state of Texas today. But this guy, Roberts, again, he has uh, ruled with Democrats on many important cases, um, on the case for same-sex sex marriage, 5-4 decision. Roberts rules with liberals on same-sex marriages, changing, you know, a, a, a key, a key um, institution in this country, the institution of marriage, was changed in a 5-4 decision. Uh, John Roberts rules with uh, liberals. Um, this case, really interesting about this case. Let me tell you about this case. 5-4 decision on DACA. DACA it stands for Deferred Action. Um, those, those are the first two words. I forget the last two words. Deferred Action. What does DACA stand for? Let me look here real quick so I can tell you. Deferred Action on Childhood Arrivals is what um, DACA stands for. Um, I didn't really need the childhood arrivals because the what I want to focus on are those first two words in DACA. Uh, the D and the A stands for Deferred Action. It, it's right there in the name that, um, that this is a temporary fix and this is a deferment for action in the future. And it was done, Obama passed DACA by executive order. So when Trump comes into, into office, a lot of people don't know this. Let me just break it down for you. So when Trump comes in, he wanted to get rid of DACA by executive order. Since Obama put it into place by executive order, and it's a temporary thing, it's just you know, a deferred action for later action. Then uh, We're expecting something to happen later <laughs> down the line. It, this is just a deferment. 
Um, so when Trump comes in, he wants to get rid of it by executive order because Obama put it in by executive order. This is, I mean, this is huge legislation that Congress has no part in. So when Trump comes in and he tries to get rid of it by executive order, he's sued by the University of California and Janet Reno at that time is the head of, of the University of California. Janet Reno, who was the attorney general under Bill Clinton, they have contrived by concert to put themselves into all of these positions. So Janet Reno, the head of the UC system, when Trump tries to get rid of DACA by executive order, sues Trump. A court in in San Francisco puts a stay on a liberal court in San Francisco issues a stay on Trump's executive order. The Supreme Court hears it and then rules in a 5-4 decision that Trump can not get rid of DACA by executive order, even though Obama had put it into place by executive order. And you want to know who the one justice was that ruled with the uh, liberals in this? Um, It was John Roberts. And my favorite John Roberts ruling, just to explain to you who this guy is, put on the bench by George W. Bush, they have contrived by concert to put themselves into all the positions of profit and power. The Affordable Care Act when the when the when the um, when they sued to get rid of the individual mandate the first time, I was blown away by this ruling. Let me explain to you what happened in the Supreme Court and what John Roberts did in a five four decision. Where does it say it at five four? Right here, Supreme Court, an opinion written by Chief Justice John Roberts, upheld by a vote of five four the individual mandate. So what you got to understand is that when uh, the Obama administration put out the ACA, Obamacare, and they were trying to sell the individual mandate as part of the Commerce Clause, it says right here, and they were telling everyone that it's not a tax, that the individual mandate is not a tax. This guy, Jonathan Gruber, He was from MIT. He was one of the um, architects of the ACA. And um, someone found these videos of him admitting what they were doing with the ACA. I want you to listen to what Gruber says here. It's just, you can't do it politically. You just literally cannot do it. Okay, transparent financing. And let's have transparent financing, also transparent spending. I mean, the this bill was written in a tortured way to make sure CBO did not score the mandate as taxes. Listen to what he's saying. That tra- we can't that that we could not be transparent with the people. That transparency sounds great. That if we could have come out a- and been transparent and said that no, uh, this doesn't have anything to do with the commerce clause. That this is a tax. That the bill would have died. So we had to lie to you. We could not be transparent, is what Jonathan Jonathan Gruber is saying here. We could not be transparent. We had to lie, and we had to write this bill in a tortured way to make to hide the fact that this is a tax, to hide that behind the Commerce Clause, and we wrote it that way in a tortured way, not to be transparent, because we knew if we were transparent that the bill would die. Listen just, to him. You can't do it politically. You just literally cannot do it. Okay, transparent financing, and let's have transparent financing, also transparent spending. I mean, the, this bill was written in a tortured way to make sure CBO did not score the mandate as taxes. If CBO scored the mandate as taxes, the bill dies. Okay, so it was written to do that. In terms of, in terms of risk-rated subsidies, if you had a law which said healthy people are going to pay in, it made explicit that healthy people pay in and sick people get money, it would not have passed. Okay, just like the people, transparent, lack of transparency is a huge political advantage. Lack of transparency is a huge political advantage. And basically, you know, call it the stupidity of the American voter or whatever. But basically, that was really, really critical to getting the thing to pass. And call it the stupidity of the American voter or whatever. You're stupid. <laughs> So we had to trick you and we could not be transparent uh, with you. So we had to hide the fact that it was a tax. So when they go into the Supreme Court in front of 
Judge Roberts, they're trying to sell this as part of the Commerce Clause. And what Judge Roberts should have done was said, no, you cannot sell this individual mandate as part of the Commerce Clause. That will not work. That's not what he did. (laughs) Judge Roberts, in his ruling, ruled with the Democrats that... No, the Commerce Clause, this doesn't fit with the Commerce Clause, this individual mandate. We can't pass it as part of the Commerce Clause, but we can pass it as a tax. And then he, Judge Roberts, from the bench, scored it as a tax. Can you believe that? Can you believe what this guy did? He told them that, no, you're wrong on the Commerce Clause, but I'm going to go ahead and rule in your favor because I'm going to score it as a tax, even though they had written it in a tortured way for it not to be scored a tax. So you can't it do would it. pass. Do it politically. You just literally cannot do it. Okay. Transparent financing. Unless I have transparent financing, also transparent spending. I mean, the this bill was written in a tortured way to make sure CBO did not score the mandate as taxes. If CBO scored the mandate as taxes, the bill dies. Okay, so it's written to do that. In terms of in terms of risk rated subsidies, if you had a law which said healthy people are going to pay in, it made explicit the healthy people pay in and sick people get money, it would not have passed. Okay, just like the people, transparent lack of transparency is a huge political advantage, and basically, you know, call it the stupidity of the American voter or whatever. But basically, that was really, really critical to getting the thing to pass. And it wasn't only critical in getting it to, to pass. It was an outright lie. It was deception. He's admitting it was deception. But for Judge Roberts, Judge Roberts is the one who says that he calls balls and strikes. That that that's the reason that he's there. He's supposed to call balls and strikes. <laughs> that's what he said about himself as a justice, and that's not what he did. He corrected the pitch. <laughs> they were trying to pitch the Commerce Clause, and he says, no, Commerce Clause, that's not a that's not a strike, but I'm going to go ahead and give you a strike because, um, because it's a tax, <laughs> even though they were trying to hide the fact that it was a tax. This guy right here, put on the bench by George W. Bush. They have contrived by concert to put themselves into positions of profit and power. Um, so I want to get into some political stuff now, and it is hot in here. How much longer do I have? Um, so what I want to get into, so now the, uh, the primary, the Republican primary is pretty much over Ted Cruz, uh, Ted Cruz, (laughs) um, Ron DeSantis has dropped out of the race and endorsed uh, Donald Trump. And um, I want to talk a little bit about this uh, this election and and talk about the Trump candidacy. Now, um, I voted for Trump twice. I plan on voting for him a, a third time um, in 2016. I started supporting Trump um, after this debate. I'm getting ready to play a clip from this debate. This was the South Carolina debate in 2016. And this is when uh, Donald Trump is uh, running against Jeb Bush. Uh, Marco Rubio is still in the race at this time. And Jeb Bush, the brother of... The guy who put this guy on the bench, (laughs) Jeb Bush, was running to be president of the United States uh, against Trump. And uh, we'll take a look at what happened in that debate. On Monday, George W. Bush will campaign in South Carolina for his brother. As you said tonight, and you've often said, the Iraq war and your opposition to it was a sign of your good judgment. In 2008, in an interview with Wolf Blitzer talking about President George W. Bush's conduct of the war, you said you were surprised that Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi didn't try to impeach him. You said, quote, which personally I think would have been a wonderful thing, uh, close quote. When you were asked what you meant by that, you said, for the war, for the war. He lied, he got us into the war with lies. 
Do you still believe President Bush should be impeached? Should have been First impeached? First of all, I have to say, as a businessman, I get along with everybody. I have business all over the world. I know so many of the people in the audience. And by the way, I'm a self-funder. I don't have. I have my wife and I have my son. That's all I have. I don't have this. So let me just tell you, I get along with everybody, which is my obligation to my company, to myself, etc. Obviously, the war in Iraq was a big, fat mistake, all right? Now, you can take it any way you want. And it took, Je it took Jeb Bush, if you remember, at the beginning of his announcement, when he announced for president, it took him five days. He went back. It was a mistake. It wasn't a mistake. It took him five days before his people told him what to say. And he ultimately said it was a mistake. The war in Iraq, we spent two trillion dollars, thousands of lives. We don't even have it. Iran is taking over Iraq. We actually spent five trillion dollars um, on the Iraq war. And Trump is absolutely right. When when this became a issue in the beginning of this campaign, Jeb Bush was asked about it, if it was a mistake or not. And uh, he defended his brother. Now, this was a really interesting question because uh, this was the first time that George Bush was coming uh, out of uh, retirement to campaign for his brother um, ever since um, he had left office in 2009 uh, with an approval rating that was in the in 28 percent that's what george bush's approval rating was when he left office in 2009 28 uh, percent and this is the first time that you'd seen this guy coming out to campaign for his brother in 2016 still very popular in 2016 and uh, if you remember trump had come in second place in iowa he had won new hampshire and they pulled this question out Knowing that Bush was still popular, trying to to fix the election to get a third Bush or Hillary Clinton, a third Bush or a Clinton is who the establishment candidates uh, were. So asking this question was a a way to to show that Trump was not loyal to the party, that he would throw a former Republican president under the bus and say that he should be impeached. And this was a tactic to 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 expose Trump as not being loyal to the party and a way to stop his momentum. It did not work out for them. And again, this is the debate when I decided to to support Trump, and I have uh, pretty much been supporting him ever since this debate. And this five is why days before his people told him what to say, and he ultimately said it was a mistake. The war in Iraq, we spent two trillion dollars, thousands of lives. We don't even have it. Iran is taking over Iraq with the second largest oil reserves in the world. Obviously, it was a mistake. So George Bush made a mistake. We so, can make mistakes. But it that wasn't one a mistake. Was a we should this is and, and the thing is, is that this was not a, it was not a mistake. What they did and 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 and. Trump is is saying what I'm getting ready to tell you as well. He's saying that they lied, but it was a mistake. Well, if they lied, it wasn't a mistake. <laughs> and it wasn't a mistake. They lied. He keeps saying it, it was a mistake, but it wasn't a mistake. And then he he does say that they lied, but it's either one or the other. Either they lied or it was a mistake, and it wasn't a mistake. They lied. Could have never been in Iraq. We have destabilized right. the Middle East. But so you so I mean so you, so you still think he should be in peace. I think it's my turn, isn't it? You do whatever you want, you call it whatever you want. I want to tell you, they lied. Okay. They said there were weapons of mass destruction, there were none, and they knew there were none. All of that's true. All of that is true. And that's not a mistake. There was no mistake. Liz Cheney's father, uh, working out of the the Pentagon with his buddy Don Rumsfeld set up the Office of Special Plans. They they set up this private intelligence operation in the Pentagon, and they created the narratives. They created the, we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud, uh, the, um, the Saddam buying uh, yellow cake uranium from Niger. Um, all of that was created in the Pentagon with this Office of Special Plans that Liz Cheney's father ran through his uh, his chief of staff, Scooter Libby, uh, Douglas Fife, Paul Wolfowitz, 
Um, they were all in this special plans uh, group in the Pentagon to sell the war in Iraq. It was not a mistake. They lied. They told us there was weapons of mass destruction. There were no weapons of mass destruction, and they knew that there were no we weapons of mass destruction. Everything that Trump says here is absolutely right. I said there were weapons of mass destruction. There were none, and they knew there were none. There were no weapons of mass right. destruction. Okay, Go, all right. Go. Governor Bush. When a member on the stage's brother gets attacked, I get brother about gets five or six. Do I get to do it five or six times or just once nice. responding to that? So here's he the said, deal. I'm being nice. I'm sick and tired <laughs> of Barack Obama blaming my brother for all of the problems that he's had. And frankly, I could, I could care less about the insults that Donald Trump gives to me. It's blood sport for him. He enjoys it, and I'm glad he's happy about it. He's but I am, sick and, tired. Million dollars I am sick and tired of him going after my family. My dad is the greatest man alive in my mind. And while while Your dad Donald was a Trump witch. was building a reality TV show, my brother was building a security apparatus to keep us safe, and I'm proud of what he did. And he's had the gall to go the after World my Trade mother. Center came he's down had the gall to go after rain. my Remember mother. That. Hold on. Let me finish this. He's right. The World Trade Center came down under his brother's reign. That's what Trump, Trump said. The World Trade Center came down under your brother's reign. Not only did the World Trade Center come down on your brother under your brother's reign, Jeb, your brother was warned that terrorists were in the country and they were planning to hijack planes a month before they hijacked planes. Trump's going to tell them that too. Hey, take, yeah, take the gall to go after rain. my Remember mother. That. Hold on. Let me finish. He's had the gall to go after my mother. That's not keeping Look, us safe. Look, I won safe. the lottery That's when not I was keeping born us safe. 63 years ago and looked up and I saw my mom. mom my mom is the strongest woman I know. She should this be is running. not about okay. my family or his family. <laughs> okay. This is about the South Carolina families that need someone to be a commander in chief that can lead. Governor, I'm that person. Governor. So anyway, uh, Trump goes on to win the South Carolina primary and to win the the nomination, but everything that he says is absolutely right. And I told you we were going to start talking about Mesopotamia in this podcast. Uh, we're going to start talking about Mesopotamia in 2003 when Bush uh, invaded Mesopotamia and lied us into a war into in, in Mesopotamia. But this region right here is Mesopotamia. This is the region that Bush took us into uh, based on lies, uh, using the attacks uh, on 9-11 and uh, lying to the nation that Saddam Hussein was in cahoots with, uh, with al-Qaeda, which that was never true. Uh, there was never any relationship uh, between al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein. There was never any nuclear program. There was never any uh, purchase of yellow cake uranium from Niger. It was all lies, and Trump was 100% right. But why was Bush um, and Liz Cheney's father so intent on invading Mesopotamia, invading Iraq. Um, who knows? I, I don't know why they were so intent. There's been a lot of theories uh, behind why they, they wanted to go in and implement a regime change in Iraq. But it set off a chain of events that we are still dealing with today. Um... This story was going around a couple of weeks ago, maybe even last week, but the it says here, former head of MI6 warns Donald Trump re-election is a national security risk for UK. Here's another article. You've probably seen it. Tons of people were reporting on it. Donald Trump re-election could threaten UK's national security uh, claims ex-MI6 boss. Um, so this ex MI6 boss who claims that Donald Trump being reelected could pose a national security risk uh, to the UK is this guy, Sir 
Richard Dearlove is his name. You can't see that. Let me show you right there. Sir Richard Dearlove. And if you know, um, if this guy is a sir, that means that he's been knighted. Um, he was probably knighted by the queen before she died. So Sir Richard Dearlove is a knight. And he was the head of MI6, the head of British intelligence, when George Bush and Tony Blair were lying us into the war in Mesopotamia. Um, and something really interesting happened in that build up to the war in Iraq and us invading Iraq and, and them selling the story uh, of weapons of mass destruction and the need to invade Iraq, not only uh, selling the story to the American people and selling it to us, but when they went to the UN selling this story on the, the world stage and um, the world was not buying it. <laughs> the United States, few in the United States were buying it, probably, you know, about 50% of the United States, hardcore Bush uh, supporters were all gung ho. You know, they, they had just been attacked, been attacked on nine 11, uh, 3000 Americans uh, dead and half of this country uh, Bush supporters were gung ho about attacking and going and uh, and uh, avenging ourselves against anyone who Bush told us was was the cause of this attack. Anyone brown? We wanted some brown people to die. Uh, about fifty percent of the country, and 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 they were buying it. Um, but the world, when we went to the UN, the world was not buying it. And that was the big problem for Tony Blair and uh, George Bush in selling it to, uh, to the world. This memo, really interesting memo, going back to Richard Dearlove, Sir Richard Dearlove, who says that if Trump is reelected, it's gonna be a national security risk. To, to the UK, and everybody was sharing this. This was a big story. You probably saw it. I mean, they probably reported on it on your favorite news channel that Richard Dearlove, the, the head uh, uh, spy, former head spy for uh, Britain, says that if Trump is reelected, then it's going to be a national security risk for UK. So this memo is a memo that was drafted by MI6 during the buildup to the war in Iraq. And it's called the Downing Street Memo. I'm going to read a little bit about the Downing Street Memo. It says, the Downing Street Memo, or Downing Street Minute, sometimes uh, described by critics of the Iraq war as the smoking gun memo, is the note of a 23 July, the 23rd of July, 2002, secret meeting of senior British government, defense and intelligence figures discussing the buildup to the war, um, discussing the buildup to the war, which included direct references to classified United States policy of the time. The name refers to 10 Downing Street, the residence of British Prime Minister, who was Tony Blair at this time. The memo written by Downing Street foreign policy aide Matthew uh, Rycroft recorded the head of secret intelligence, who's the head of secret intelligence at this time? Sir Richard Dearlove is the head of secret intelligence at this time. So Matthew uh, Rycroft who's basically an aide to Richard Dearlove, he records this in the minutes from Richard Dearlove as expressing the following, uh, expressing the view, the view, as expressing the view following his recent visit to Washington that George W. Bush wanted to remove Saddam Hussein through military action justified by conjunction of terrorism and WND, but the intelligence and facts were being fixed around the policy. This is in the minutes. This is in his notes. Richard 
Dearlove, the head of MI6 at this time, Sir Richard Dearlove, knew that the policy and the facts didn't fit what George Bush and Tony Blair were telling everybody about weapons of mass destruction, that Richard Dearlove knew that the weapons of mass destruction claim was fraudulent and that there were no weapons of mass destruction. Let me read this again. That Matthew Rycroft recorded the head of secret intelligence, Sir Richard Dearlove, MI6, as expressing the view following his recent visit to Washington that George W. Bush wanted to remove Saddam Hussein through military action, justified by a conjunction the conjunction of terrorism and WND, but the intelligence and the facts were being fixed around the policy. This becomes very interesting because in 2002, George Bush, at his State of the Union address, he says this. The British government has learned that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. So... That's called the 16 words that George Bush says in his State of the Union in 2002. And that was absolutely explosive because George Bush had been warned by his own CIA over and over again that the yellow cake uranium uh, from Niger, that story that Saddam Hussein was trying to buy yellow cake uranium from Niger, that that was fraudulent and it was not true. George Tenet, the director of CIA, told Bush that directly. The Bush administration knew this, and they were, it was repeated several times that that story was a lie. So in, instead of attributing this bogus intelligence to his own intelligence agency, the CIA, he, he attributes, Bush attributes this bogus intelligence to British intelligence, to Sir Richard Dearlove, and Richard Dearlove knew that the facts were being fixed around the policy. It was all bogus. But again, Richard Dearlove's probably a, a witch because <laughs> all of these witches, they have, con they have contrived by concert to put themselves into position of profit, and power. Well, that's it. That's episode 179. I'll be back on Friday, and then we're going to get really into Mesopotamia. We're going to get into Mesopotamia um, and go back to Sumeria um, and Babylon, and uh, we're going to talk about that region of present-day Iraq, 5,000 years ago. And um, I'll see you guys on Friday. Thank you.